Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. And listen, they weren't just astonished at what they said. They were astonished at who was saying it. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. And it was just as the angel had told them. Let's pray. Father, would you add your anointing, your illumination, your spirit to this word? Lord, the presence, your presence that we sense in this house right now. I pray, God, that we receive your word in this presence. God, that we stay focused on you, hearing what your word says and how it applies to our lives and to our church. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, if you ask any child, and I would venture to say any child of any age, what they like most about Christmas Almost universally, they're going to give you the same response. What is it? The presents. They like the gifts. Everybody likes to receive gifts, no matter what age you are. And, and although we talk about the existence of the naughty list and the nice list, the reality is we all receive gifts that we don't deserve, right? Amen. And that really tells us more about the giver than it does about the receiver, a person with a giving heart will give even when the recipient isn't deserving. Now, when you look at the biblical account of Christmas, you see the heart of the giver is exposed. The capital G, giver. His heart's exposed because truly Christmas is about gifts. But it's not about the things that are concealed under the tree. It's about what's revealed on the tree. You understand? What Jesus was born to do, what he fulfilled on the cross, was to bring us a new and exciting gift. Jesus came to give us the gift of the gospel of grace. He gave, he gave us the gospel of grace. He came to give us his favor. Even though he knew and we know we don't deserve his favor. We don't deserve His grace. Grace is that favor. It's that power to do for us and in us what we can't do ourselves. That's what started in the, in the manger and was finished on the cross. So of all the gifts that we celebrate this season, let's celebrate the gift of the gospel of grace. So we're going to talk about that for just a minute because it's expressed in a lot of ways in our lives. I want to talk about three of them really quickly. And then let's spend a little bit of time talking about how they can affect, how they can and should affect our lives and our church. So first of all, the gospel of grace welcomes us. The gospel of grace welcomes us. In the passage that we just read, we already see just how unusual the life of Jesus is going to be. I know most of you have heard this before, but it bears repeating. There is no reason in the world why shepherds should have been the first to hear the gospel that Jesus was born. No reason that they should have heard first. I mean, a visitation from angels, a heavenly choir for the shepherds? These are the last people in Bethlehem to expect a divine angelic visitation. I mean, shepherds didn't get invited to nothing. Nothing. Much less the birth of the king. They didn't get invited to any. Nobody even noticed the shepherds. They were just part of the landscape. Like you just riding down the road from Bethlehem and you just like sheep, 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 shepherd, sheep, tree, bush, right? They're just part of the landscape. Nobody thinks about them because they're dirty. They live with animals. They're dirty. They're stinky. They smell like sheep. They're just common people. And yet, 
the birth of Jesus started changing all of that. The gospel of grace that Jesus would bring began at his birth. And now, even shepherds are welcome into the presence of God. And not only were they told that it had happened, they were invited to be by his side. They were invited to come. You say, John, I don't remember them inviting them. Then why else would they say, you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a... Why would they just gave him directions They said, go find this little dude. He's in Bethlehem. Go find him. The the angels came to announce that something new was happening, something different, something that that, uh, would change everything for the shepherds and for everybody else. And that thing is the gospel of grace that welcomes us into God's presence even when we don't deserve it. Amen? Amen? So it's that gospel of grace that that does that for us. Now, why in the world would God do that? Why would he do that? Because, listen, when you're God, you ain't got to do nothing. Right? What's the kids say now? I do what I want. Well, that's like true when you're God. You do what you want. Why would he do that? Well, the relig- that's what, exactly what the church people wanted to know when he came to earth. The religious people it drove him nuts, and they, they asked him about that in Luke chapter 5. Verses 27 through 32. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collecting booth. Follow me, he said, and be my disciple. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed Jesus. But later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees, each of the church people, the religious people, teachers of religious law, complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Look at this. Listen to this coming out of the mouth of the church people. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them. After he punched them in the nose. Not really, he didn't. Jesus answered them. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come, I love this, I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, (laughs) but those who know they're sinners and need to repent. The grace that Jesus preached, he not only preached, but he walked in it. He welcomed everybody into his presence. And he told them why in that moment. Because Jesus knew that you can't be influenced by what you're not around. How will people ever be changed by the gospel if they aren't welcome to hear it? How will people ever surrender to a God that they can't approach? You see, Jesus was perfect, and He was holy, and He was righteous. They didn't deserve to be in His presence, but that didn't stop Him from welcoming them and spending time with them. You see, the lesson of Christmas, the lesson of the gospel, is that whosoever will may come to Jesus. And not just come, but be welcome. And listen, and not just welcome, but welcome on equal footing with everybody else. No matter who's in the room, he treats everybody the same. How in the world do you do that? The adulterer, the prostitute, the Gentile, the common, the wealthy, the wounded, the bitter. How do you do that? How does Jesus see everybody the same? Because God's standard of measurement is completely different than the world's standard. You see, we judge on wealth and power and prestige and beauty and influence But God said in 1 Samuel, he said, you humans, y'all look on the outside, but I look on the heart. God looks on the heart. Now listen, that's the good news and the bad news. The bad news is, Jeremiah said the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So, John, what does that mean? That means when God looks at my heart, all he's going to see is that I am absolutely as bad as I appear to be or worse. You can't fool him because he sees, sees the heart. The good news is everybody, everybody's heart looks the same when God looks at him. 
Because that's why he sent Jesus. See, God doesn't look in our hearts and go, Oh, I can't believe that. He knows exactly what's in your heart. He knows, he knows our hearts are a black hole. He knows that. That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. The book of Romans says there's no one righteous, not even a single person. That's why his grace extends to the broken and the needy and the rich and the poor and the prostitute and the adulterer and the criminal and the self-righteous. All of us need the grace of God. And it's a gift. It is the gift of the gospel of grace that welcomes us all into the presence of God. And that's good news. Here's the second thing that the gospel of grace does for us. It doesn't just welcome us. It saves us. The gospel of grace saves us. How terrible would it be for God to welcome us into his presence, to give us the grace to come into his presence despite our sinful condition, but then not be able to do anything about our sinful condition? Like His grace doesn't just welcome us, but it saves us. It saves us from our sins and when, when we'll repent. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 4 through 9, Ephesians chapter 2. But God is so rich in mercy. Mercy and grace are, are, are closely related. I mean, they are, they are brothers. Um, he, is, he is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. Now look at this in parentheses. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. If you've been saved, if you've been saved, it's because of God's grace. Look at verse 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he's done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Can you hang on right for a second, Heather? Go back to verse 7. Look at that. God saved us by his grace. So God can use us as examples of his incredible wealth of grace and kindness. You're like, why in the world did God save somebody like me? What could he see in me? Because he's going to use you as an example for everybody else who was just like you or worse. There are people that when they get saved, their testimony is, if he can save me, he can save anybody. Right? Y'all, you ever said that about, or at least, no, y'all good Christians, y'all wouldn't say that. Y'all ever think that about somebody? Like, that, like that you see them, they, they're, they're like, for real saved, you're like, man, God like really did it up on that one. I didn't, I didn't think he or she could ever be saved. God uses us as examples for the future ages so they can say as bad as he was, as bad as she was, he still saved them, still saved them, still loved them, still welcomed them. That's great news. How is that? Well, look at verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. So it ain't about you. It's about him. It's not about the gift. It's about the giver. It's about, not about the recipient, it's about the giver. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So none of us can boast about it. What God offers to us is not about us, it's about Him. You see how many times Paul used the word grace in, in those few verses? See, Jesus doesn't just identify the problem, which is sin. He also offers a solution, which is Himself. When we get in His presence... We are faced with a decision. You get in his presence, you're faced with a decision. We can either be repelled by his holiness and driven away by him, or, or we can fall at his feet and ask for his help. We don't deserve it, but he offers it. But listen, it's our choice. It's our choice to make. His grace is not imposed upon you, you freely receive it. You are completely welcome to reject it. You shouldn't. I hope you don't. I hope you haven't. But it's your prerogative. 
Look at John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And we usually quote that and stop. But look at verse 17. Because God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world. The King James says not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. It's a whole different deal. That's the gospel of grace. It's knowing who we are. It's knowing what we've done and extending grace to us anyway. But keep reading. Verses 18 through 21. There is no judgment or condemnation against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who doesn't believe in him has already been condemned or judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, that's Jesus, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what's right come to the light so others can see that they're doing what God wants. Do you remember, if you're a believer, do you remember when you're just beginning to come to the Lord and you just dreaded to go to church? You were just, you were terrified. Because something, you don't know anything about theology, you just knew that as soon as you walked in the door, God was going to know everything that you did. Right? And, and the, Now, the deception of the devil is that he has to wait until you get in the church before he knows. Because the reality is, he already knew anyway. So it ain't like something's going to change when you come to the church. But when you get in the presence of God, you come face to face with the truth about yourself. And if you don't have the righteousness of Christ to place upon you, which is what he offers to us, then we don't measure up. The good news of the gospel of grace is that we don't come to him by ourselves and of ourselves with our own righteousness because our righteousness stinks. We come with the righteousness of Christ. That's what the gospel of grace extends to us. But listen, if you prefer the darkness to the light, if you love your sin more than you love forgiveness, if you love bondage more than you love freedom, if you love spiritual death more than you love spiritual life, then you have every right to walk away from the gospel of grace. But if you have had enough, if you're ready to come to right relationship with God through Jesus, even though you know you don't deserve it, He has the power not just to welcome you, but to save you from your sin. He cleanses and pardons and forgives and forgets and never holds it against you again. It's just as if you had never done anything wrong. The old you passes away. The new you comes to life. And, and, and it, it's a gift. It's a gift. It's, it's, the, it's a blessing because he's good and he loves to give. That's the gospel of grace that Jesus offers. But here's the last thing. The last thing is the God, that the gospel of grace offers to us is not that he just welcomes us and saves us, but that he cleanses us. He cleanses us. And listen, it's not a one-time deal. It's not a one-time deal. Why do you think so many sinners were attracted to and received the message of Jesus? Why do you think the, the, the religious people ran and the sinners ran to him? Because it was in such stark contrast to the message of the Pharisees. What Jesus preached was completely different than what the Pharisees preached, the religious people. Jesus preached a gospel of grace that offered them hope. The religious people had nothing to offer but condemnation and finger pointing. They could only tell you what you were doing wrong. They had nothing positive to offer. And if by chance you started getting it together and started consistently doing what you were supposed to do, guess what? They came up with something else that you were supposed to do that you hadn't been doing. They, they changed the rules in the middle of the game. You ever played with kids who did that? You ever play with adults who did that? Just change the rules in the middle of the game. Oh, no, we're not doing that anymore. Why? Because you're losing. That's why. 
They changed the rules. I've been arguing with children, and they changed sides of the argument in the middle. I'm like, you can't do that. We can't be on the same side. That's what the Pharisees did. They changed the rules in the middle of the game. Why? Because the outcome was a foregone conclusion. You were going to lose no matter what they had to do. The game was rigged. The game was rigged. The Pharisees are always the winners. And that's the way a lot of people feel when they come to church. They feel like the game's rigged. Like no matter what they do, no matter how, no matter how good they are, no matter what they change, it's never going to be good enough. I've known men who for 20 years spent every weekend and most of the weekdays lying and cheating and drinking and cussing and doing drugs and chasing women and, and then God saves them miraculously and radically and they quit doing all that stuff. But then some Christian sees them smoking a cigarette and they lose their minds. Right? They just come and they just bring condemnation on them and they, they beat on them for you're ruining your witness and you're supposed to be a Christian and I wonder if you ever even got saved. And, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, are we just going to ignore all the mess that's fallen out of these people's lives in the last three months and just focus on the one thing that they hadn't beat yet? That's why people hate church people. We See, we preach that we're created in God's image so people look at us and the world just assumes that God is angry and vengeful and spiteful and judgmental all the time too. Because it's the only kind of Christians they've ever met. But that's not the deal at all. You're like, Pastor, are you in favor of Christian smoking? Would you calm down? No. No, I, no, don't reach under your seat. I don't have a pack of Marlboros stuck under there for everybody. I'm just saying sometimes we can stop reaching under there. They're not under there. Stop it. Some of y'all smoke camels anyway, so quit. I'm just saying sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. But pastor, God calls us to be holy. I know but maybe we've misunderstood the whole concept. I learned a lot about this from, from one of my spiritual heroes, Dr. Mark Rutland. And, and so let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. So Peter says, Peter's writing this letter. He says, so you must live as God's obedient children. Why can Peter write that? Because he was one of God's disobedient children most of his life. And he's finally maturing and growing he said, you, you got to live like God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy. And as if that's not challenging enough, then he just rams it home. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Quoting God. So there it is, ladies and gentlemen. That's where God said it. Be holy because I'm holy. But listen, he's not setting you up for failure. He's offering you his credentials. Think about it this way. It's like walking into an advanced math class in college. Anybody ready to walk into an advanced math class right now? Just like ready to go knock it out. Um, it's like walking into an advanced math class and the teacher says... You're going to be great at math because I'm great at math. See, it's not like the teacher's just going to show up on the first day and give you the syllabus and all the assignments and then show back up on the last day and give the final exam. He or she is going to be there with you every day, teaching you what they've already mastered. They're not holding you to an impossible standard. They're simply telling you where they're going to take you. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2 and 18. This is talking about Jesus. Since he himself, since Jesus has gone through suffering and testing, he's able to help us when we're being tested. 
Y'all ever, in a, in, a, in a class in high school or college, you went and talked to somebody who's already taken that class? Yes? No. Didn't care that much? <laughs> anyway, so a lot of times that's what you'll do. You're like, how was this test? You know, if you, you got a friend that took it in first block, you got to go find out, how was the test? What was on it? He's like, ah, having a meltdown. Jesus came in the flesh so that he could support us and encourage us when we face life's temptations. Why? Because he's already taken the test. He lived his life on earth. He faced, the Bible says, every temptation that we face. Only he did it without sin. But he didn't do it to brag about it. He didn't do it to make you feel bad and rub your face in it. He's telling you, be holy because I'm holy. I've been there and done that. I can help you face your temptations because I've already faced those temptations. I know how overwhelming they can be. I understand how enticing they are, but I can show you the way of escape. I am holy. I can show you how to be holy. I avoided temptation, so I can show you how to avoid temptation. You say, but John, I'm not perfect and Jesus was perfect. No, but he lives in us. Through His Holy Spirit. And the Bible says if we will die to ourselves, then He will live through us. Dead to self, but alive. Dead to sin, but alive in Christ. That's the gospel of grace. So listen, Jesus isn't scolding you, and He's not fussing at you when you fail. He's, he's helping us up. He's dusting us off. He's sending us right back out there. He's not an angry deity waiting to zap you. He's the greatest coach you've ever had. He's cheering you on. He's coaching you up. He's making you a better player every day if you let him. That's the gospel of grace. It's not about working hard so you can get in the coach's good graces. It's that you've already made the team. And he's just trying to help you learn to play the game better. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. He didn't lower the standard. He, he still demands holiness. He still demands that we live a holy life. Why? Because we're carrying his name. Our team name is across our t-shirt. So he's not changing the rules of the game just because you stink at it. He's not going to give you 12 strikes before you're out. He's just committing... He's committed to showing you how to win. You see the difference? It's not law, it's love. It's not gotcha, it's grace. And because of His grace, He welcomes us, He saves us, and He cleanses us over and over again. That's the greatest gift at Christmas, right? The greatest thing we could ever receive. But how does that affect us Every day. How does that affect our lives? And how does it affect our effectiveness as believers, as disciples of Jesus? Well, here's the answer to those questions. Because we don't just have to believe it, we have to practice it every day. See, the, the problem in the American church is not that we don't know, it's that we don't believe. We don't practice. You understand, we have... Free of charge, we have every translation of the Bible that's ever been translated. We've got access to study material from every theologian and scholar that we can imagine. It's not that we have a lack of knowledge in our brains. We have a lack of connectivity between our brain and our life center. Not that we need to know more. We need to do more of what we know. So here's the deal. We can't preach a gospel of grace until we've not only partaken of His grace, but we've learned to walk in His grace. You can't preach freedom when you're still in bondage. Well, you can, but it's no good. It doesn't do any good because it's not rooted in anything real. We, we have to be the first partakers of the fruit of the vine. We have to receive God's grace into our lives. We can't walk in condemnation and in guilt and in shame 
And you look at the lives of Christians, and that's, that's what you see in too many Christians. We're walking around like we're expecting to be zapped any minute, like just fried. You're like God just found out, and he's like, oh, no, you're not going to do that. Come on. There is, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. Conviction takes you from where you are and says the path that you're on is not a good one, so change so that your future's better. Condemnation takes you where you are and points you backwards to stuff you've already done. So we have to learn how to walk in the gift of the gospel of grace. We have to learn how to accept grace. What I have discovered, the older I get, is that people who condemn others are typically walking in condemnation for themselves. Amen. And here's what I've learned, is that the hardest person to forgive in all the world is us, ourselves. So how, are we gonna, how can we operate in the, gift of grace, in the gospel of grace? Well, we have to be quick to repent of our own sins. Because those things kill our intimacy and our relationship with God. But when we repent, we have to recognize we're forgiven. And we have to learn to forgive ourselves. And then we can learn to extend that grace to everybody else. So that we're not holding each other accountable for stuff that we've already got under the blood. So John, how does this, how does this affect our church? Why is that important that we're talking about this now? Well, last week we talked about the Jericho Project. We talked about the fact that these buildings next door, we're going to have to get the, the hazmat out, then we're going to have to demo those, and then we can begin to, to build a future here where we, we're going to build a kids' ministry building and we're going to build a, a track for the community to come and walk and we're going to be able to get involved in, in rescuing women who are being trafficked now and all of that stuff. But listen, if we're going to succeed at discipling children, if we're going to succeed at welcoming community members to our property, if we're going to succeed at rescuing women from sex trafficking, if we're going to succeed at the Great Commission to go and make disciples, then we're going to have to learn and preach and teach and practice the gospel of grace. We're, we're going to have to learn to value people, not on, not on who they are, but on who their creator is. Not on any external measures. We've got to look on the heart. We can't, we can't look on what they've done, not on how many times and which sins they've engaged in. We're going to have to learn to look at people as if they are no different than we are, because guess what? They're not. They're not. Those of us who have come to Jesus, we know Jesus has changed us. But remember what Ephesians said. That has nothing to do with you. That's all Jesus. So we can't brag about being saved, and we can't put somebody else down for not being saved because it really had nothing to do with us. The only thing we said was yes. Look at James chapter 2. If you are in the mood to have your feelings hurt, then read the book of James. Chapter 2 says, My dear brothers and sisters, hey, don't believe that. He's setting you up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting, that's your church meetings, dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another person comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, hey, you can stand over there or sit in the floor, you know, whatever. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by your evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? And aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into the courts? Aren't they the ones who slandered Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed, it's good when we obey the royal law found in the Scriptures, love your neighbor, every neighbor, as yourself. 
So you think, you think God's serious about this whole grace for everybody thing? You think he's serious about loving one another and not judging one another? So let's think of it in the context of, of the Jericho Project. You know, last week I, I told you it's time for us to start rescuing the Rahabs. Rescuing the Rahabs. So what, what, does, that, what does that mean? What's, what's going to happen? I believe that as, as we begin to pray about that and begin to pr- get in, in, involved in that, I believe God's going to start sending them in. Before you get too excited, I need you to imagine what's going to happen. I need you to picture this. How are we going to respond the first time a prostitute comes in on a Sunday morning still dressed from a busy Saturday night? You church people with me now? How are we going to respond? See, we can gasp and pull her to the side and demand that she cover up her body and we can hide our husbands and our kids. Or we can welcome her to the house of the Lord. We can look her in the eyes and only in the eyes. And make her feel like she's in the right place. We can judge her for coming in looking like that. Or we can rejoice that she has the chance to experience love and freedom and and God's presence maybe for the first time in her life. How are we going to make her feel? And you're like, I don't know. We'll just have to figure it out. No, you, you've got to make a decision. It's a decision. It will, they hadn't, hadn't ever come in before, probably because we're not ready yet. Because why would God send somebody who's been ravished and rejected every day of the week into a church that's going to ravish and reject her and push her away from her one chance at meeting the Jesus that we claim saved our lives. You say, well, John, I don't know. I would never say anything, but I don't know how I feel. It'll be all over your face. So we got to start fixing the face. You can't fix your face. You have to fix what causes your face, and that's your heart. So we have to decide now, how are we going to make her feel? Special or spectacle? Is it going to be law or grace? Y'all still with me? Good, because I'm going to keep driving. What if on the same day that the prostitute comes to church... So does the rich man who hires her every Thursday night. If we treat the prostitute differently than we treat her high-powered customers, James says we're a disgrace to the name of Jesus and in violation of the gospel of grace. What about her pimp? Can he come in? Can he get saved? What happens when he comes in? Will he find enough grace here to welcome him, to draw him to Jesus so that he can be saved and cleansed? Or will all we have to offer him is rejection and judgment? You see, I think having a a prostitute wandering off the street is a great indicator of the level of grace and freedom that a church is walking in. John, what do you mean? Well, remember what we said about gift giving? That it says more about the giver than it does about the receiver? Well, how you treat somebody really says more about who you are than about who they are. And if we don't have enough of the Spirit of God in us to stop seeing her as a prostitute and start seeing her as a lost soul in need of a Savior, then she might not be the only one who's in need of deliverance in that service. Maybe we've misunderstood the gospel. Maybe we've misunderstood the Great Commission. We have to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. Maybe we've forgotten that the gospel we preach is the gospel of grace. 
So you say, John, why, why, are, you so, why are you so hung up on, uh, on the Rahabs of the world? Like of all the things we could do, why the Rahabs? Why, why would Jesus even want us to minister to the prostitutes and to the outcasts? It's actually a pretty easy answer. Let me show it to you in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Matthew 1 and verse 1. It says, This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. This is Jesus' family tree. Look at verse 5. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, a Gentile from the land of Moab. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. She had had an affair with King David. Why are we so hung up on the outcasts and the prostitutes? Why is Jesus so concerned that we go and find those people? Because Rahab was the great-grandmother of King David. She's a part of the bloodline of the Holy Virgin Mary. Sarcasm added. You know what that means? Rahab is kin to Jesus. She's part of the family. And every Rahab and the lowly shepherds and and every common person and the outcasts and the rejects and you and me and the person beside you, every sinner, every human being is welcomed into the presence of God to be saved and to be cleansed and to be made a part of the family of Jesus. Not just 2,000 years ago, but today. That's the gospel of grace. That's why it's important. That's how it affects your every day. It's the gospel of grace that we're called to not just know, but to experience for ourselves and to extend to everybody else at Christmas and every other season of the year. Won't you stand with me? been praying all weekend about what, what's the altar call? How do you respond to this message? <clears throat> and I think that's going to be a personal decision between you and the Lord. Here's the thing. Um, I think some of us are going to have to deal with the Lord about walking in grace for ourselves. I think there's a whole lot of people who are in this service who are walking in condemnation. All they ever, when they get up, they look in the mirror, all they see is a person that's not worthy, a person who's not measuring up, a person who's failed. They have shame, they have guilt, they have condemnation. No matter how many times they've prayed, all they can do is walk around knowing that they're just not ever going to measure up. You've got to learn to walk in grace. You've got to learn to walk in forgiveness. That when you repent, it's gone. God's not holding it against you, so who are you to hold it against yourself? And then maybe maybe we also need to pray about being able to extend that grace to other people. There's a whole lot of judgment in the American church. Listen, I've been in the church since nine months before I was born. I know church people. And I'm just going to tell you, it's hard It's hard to grow up in church and not have a religious spirit, not be judgmental because it's been hammered into our brains what we, the the standard, the checklist, the things that we think we should see. And so we've got to figure out how to walk in the gospel of grace and learn to receive people without judging them and condemning them. God, 
sent, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to condemn and convict, to convict and to show us the way. He does not need our help. And then there might be some of you today that just have never met Jesus in the first place. You've never surrendered your life to Him. You, you're still carrying all your sin. You didn't even know that was a thing. You're our, you're our special guest. We've been praying for you especially. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, I would love to show you how to do that. So in just a second, I'm going to pray. And then they're going to, the team's going to come. We're going to sing one more song together. We'll be dismissed at the end. If you want to pray about any of these things or about anything that's going on in your life, then you're welcome to come and meet Jesus here.